You're listening to Practical Ethics Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. Practical Ethics Bites is made in association with Oxford's Uhiro Centre for Practical Ethics. Do you have a choice about whether you're attracted to men, women, both or neither? Probably not, though you clearly do have some choice in most situations about whether you act on your inclinations. The conventional categories may be somewhat crude, but we do all find ourselves somewhere on a spectrum. Does it follow from this, though, that you can't choose to be gay, straight, bisexual, or even asexual? You might think it would, but according to Brian Earp, it doesn't. We can, he suggests, make important choices about our sexual identities. Brian Earp? Welcome to Practical Ethics Bites. Thanks very much for having me on. The topic we're going to address today is whether you can be gay by choice. Perhaps we should begin by defining our terms. What is it to be gay? I think if you were to ask most people what it means to be gay, they would say it means that your attractions are either predominantly or exclusively oriented toward members of your same sex group. I think that's partly true. That's part of the way to a good definition. But I would say also that to be gay, as opposed to experiencing predominantly or exclusively same-sex attractions, is more a question of identity. So whether you choose this label to apply to yourself, whether you want to call yourself gay, or you might say I'm straight, or you might say I'm bisexual, and these are the three commonly used orientation categories that are floating around in contemporary Western society. But these weren't always the categories that were used. Human sexuality falls on a spectrum. Not everybody can neatly place themselves in one of these buckets or the other. And so I would draw a distinction between being gay, as you've put it, which is an identity label, a linguistic tag that you're placing on yourself to pick out where you fall on the spectrum, and that lower level question of what your attractions really are. Do you find yourself basically drawn to members of the same sex or what's sometimes called the opposite sex or not? That would be a starting place. Well, you've touched on this now, but choice. To what extent can one choose one's sexuality? So as I suggested, sexuality in terms of what you find yourself attracted to really falls on a spectrum. There aren't really just three types of people, the gay people, the straight people, and the bisexual people. Those are sort of uh, rough heuristics or categories that we use to boil down the conversation and make it a little bit easier. So you do have a choice in what to call yourself. If you call yourself gay, what you're probably saying is I find myself predominantly or exclusively attracted to members of the same sex. And I just want to flag that that's complicated too because even sex characteristics fall on a spectrum and some people are what are called intersex individuals who aren't clearly male or female. So all of this is a bit more complicated than is commonly talked about. But you do have choice in how to refer to yourself. What most people would say is that you don't have choice, however, on that lower level category in terms of what your attractions really are. So if you're predominantly attracted to members of the same sex, that's not up to you. It's commonly argued, whereas what you call yourself, there may be some room for choice there. Presumably you have a choice in how you behave as well. That's another area where there's choice. So if you were to think of the example of a conservative religious community in which same-sex behavior is condemned, you could imagine somebody who was born into this environment who feels very strongly attracted to members of the same sex and not at all to members of the opposite sex, but who nevertheless, due to community pressure or maybe they've internalized these norms or beliefs, would choose not to act on those attractions. And so that's another level at which choice could factor into the equation. We've defined our terms, what is it to be gay and what is it to have a choice. Why does this matter? I think the main reason it matters is because contemporary political debates about whether it should be okay or not okay to discriminate against people on the basis of their sexuality tend to hinge on a certain argument. And the argument goes like this, because I can't choose to be gay, it's often said. Therefore, it's not just or appropriate or moral for you to discriminate against me. And then it sort of follows from this that the state should offer some form of protection. So it should be illegal to discriminate against people who, as it said, are gay. 
Well, this is a compelling argument. It seems like the sort of thing that's analogous to racism. So if I can't choose my skin color, you shouldn't be able to discriminate against me on the basis of my skin color. And so it's a very compelling argument. But I think it rests on a couple of misconceptions. So they can choose whether to identify as gay, although it would be a bit strange if you had exclusively same-sex attractions and then you use some other label. You said, well, I'm straight. That would be very confusing to do that simply because you don't ordinarily get to make up your own personal meanings for words and apply them willy-nilly and expect others to go along with you. But whether you choose to identify as gay, given especially the spectrum of attractions that exist and the fact that it isn't really a neat three-part category reality, there does seem to be some wiggle room anyway for how you choose to identify. But Earlier, I mentioned that there's a distinction between how you identify, so whether you want to call yourself gay or associate your identity primarily with these lower level attractions, there seems to be some room there. There's nobody forcing you to call yourself gay. But then the argument rests on whether you can choose those low level attractions. And there I think there's a stronger argument, which is that if you can exercise some choice in how you identify, most people would say that you can't exercise choice in your basic attractions. Not all objections to discrimination rest on the idea that people can't choose who they are. I'm thinking in particular of discrimination against religious groups. We think that it's not appropriate to discriminate against, I don't know, Catholics in this country, even though obviously it is a choice whether or not one is a Catholic or becomes a Catholic. Yeah, this is an interesting case because... On the one hand, you would say there's some choice. I'm not forced to be a Catholic or a Protestant or Hindu or whatever. But it it is nevertheless something that most people are brought up in a religion. It's very deeply intertwined into their identity. So it isn't just like a baseball cap that you can switch on and off. And I think people who do convert from one religion to another or leave the religion altogether of their parents and adopt maybe an atheistic worldview, it can be very difficult and it can involve a lot of psychological strain to have to go through. But at the same time, it proves the point that a total lack of ability to choose isn't ordinarily seen as the only way to defend against discrimination. There are some things, such as your religious affiliation, in which there's room for choice that nevertheless we've decided as a society it's inappropriate to discriminate against people on the basis of their religious affiliation. And so I think there may be some lesson here as well for the case of sexual orientation. Even if there were some room for how you identified in terms of your sexual orientation, that wouldn't necessarily mean that it was therefore okay to discriminate against you based on this analogy with the religious example. Something we haven't yet talked about, but presumably with scientific advances, it might be possible in the future that we might actually be able to have a choice about our sexuality, either for ourselves or for our children. And then it can't be disputed that there will be a choice to be gay or straight. So nobody knows exactly how a person's sexual orientation comes about. It seems to be a combination of factors, genetic factors, factors in the early womb environment, early experiences, and so on. All of these things combine to tilt a person's sexual attractions one way or the other. And largely, it's outside of people's control, as far as we know. It isn't the sort of thing that you can influence. You come into the world, and you find yourself attracted to this sort of person or that sort of person. But insofar as there are biological bases to people's sexual attractions, then at least in principle, in some future state of technological development, it seems like it might be possible to intervene in those biological systems and actually change people's sexual attractions down at that very basic level of biology that I was talking about earlier. So this raises an interesting problem. What if it's the case that in 10 or 15 or 20 years, it is possible not only to exercise some choice in how you identify at that higher level, but actually exercise some choice in terms of to whom you're basically attracted in this very physical low-level sense. And if that were the case, the argument, you can't discriminate against me because I can't choose my sexual attractions, would begin to look a, a little less powerful. So we then have to fall back on other arguments. We can no longer say it's not a choice to be gay or not to be gay. It clearly would be a choice in that situation. Would that then open up the possibility of discrimination or would there be arguments we could then fall back on to prevent discrimination against gay people? It seems to me that a strong argument that would not depend on future technological developments going one way or the other 
would be an argument based on individual rights, where we would say, we think as a society that it's appropriate for individuals, whatever their sex or gender, whatever orientation they use to describe themselves, should be able to have consensual sexual interactions with people who equally consent to the interaction, and that others should sort of keep their noses out of it. There's a strange compulsion in many societies to sort of peer into the bedrooms of other people and want to have a say over how they interact with those that they're attracted to or those whom they love. I think it's a sort of strange compulsion, and I think that a stronger set of arguments going forward would say that what happens in people's bedrooms, so long as it's consensual, is up to them, and what their sexuality is, quite separate from that question. So I'd favor an individual rights-based argument. Brian Earp, thank you very much. Thank you. For more Practical Ethics Bites, go to www.practicalethics.ox.ac.uk.